Thank you to Target for sponsoring this episode. Target is committed to using their size, skill, and resources to help heal and create lasting change in Minneapolis and across the country. Up next, she's the first African-American president of the ACLU. She's also a civil rights lawyer and an NYU professor. She is Deborah Archer. Enjoy the show. This conversation on the podcast is coming to our listeners through a partnership that we did with Westminster Town Hall Forum. And that conversation you can find on their website, and it was aired on NPR. This is a bit of the, you know, after, the (laughs) in-between, you know, (laughs) where we can talk a little bit. And um, I've learned a couple of things uh, about you, and one is that you're a mom of sons. Yes. Yes. And I am a mom of four sons and a daughter. This last year has uh, brought me to a new place as parent. I've had many, many uh, stops along the journey. My oldest is is now 28. Um, but this last year, um, I have thought more about what their reality looks like growing up with these images of Black men getting killed or Black people getting killed, yeah. because now I'm bringing my daughter into this conversation in a different way than I have in the past. Yeah. Yeah, just talk about being mom for a minute. Yeah, I, when you raise the, the, the images and seeing this on the television and then being home because of the pandemic and seeing this kind of repeated and repeated and repeated on the television, raised for me questions about how much was too much for them, right? Trying to strike a balance, which is something that I think a, a balance we try to strike every day, or at least I try to spri- strike every day as the mother of, of, of Black boys, giving them enough information to make them aware of the challenges in, inside the, 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 the way that society is going to react to them because they are black boys, giving them enough information so they can um, protect themselves in this world, that they can adjust their behavior as they need to, to be safe. Um, but I also just don't want my children who are 15 and 17 uh, to feel traumatized, to, right? To, how much is too much that I'm traumatizing them? And with the, those images that were coming every day of just graphically seeing the moments at which people were losing their lives and the violence, uh, I got to a point where I had to take a step back and is letting them watch it too much? Is letting them watch it um, harming them more than it is benefiting them? They they understand what's going on in the world. Do they need to keep seeing uh, these images, I did take a, a point at which I had to shut off the television for them mm-hmm. and for me, for us all to take a break um, for a couple of days from what was going on in the world. But it was difficult. We live in Manhattan and um, in an apartment in our living room window faces Broadway um, in lower Manhattan. And every day, multiple times a day, there were protests up and down. Broadway. Uh, many times during the day, we would go down and join the protests. Um, so it was something that I couldn't protect them from entirely. But I certainly thought about how do we strike a balance. I'm wondering for you, how did you strike a balance between um, wanting your children to know, understand, and feel deep in their mm-hmm. bones the kind of injustice that was going on? But being a mother and wanting to protect them from the kind of trauma that comes from seeing people who look like you murdered at the hands of the state. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In my case, I guess I have the benefit of having four Mm -hmm. that range from 28 to 15. And so um, the conversations they have amongst each other are different than the ones they have with me. Um, I did have a second when the verdict, I knew the verdict was going to be announced and I wanted them all to be with me, like, just come sit with me on the couch. And my youngest was, had zero interest in watching it. 
And I had, you know, you get down here like moment, like you <laughs> right now. I want like this is a moment in history and you need to be part of it. And um, I, I said it and then I stopped. And in recognition that they need to take this in in a way that makes sense for them. And so I think I've I've had to balance sort of the historical moment that the verdict and sort of um, the significance of what happened following George Floyd's death to a movement of policing that we hope will improve. I've had to separate that from the mental health and wellness Mm -hmm. of my children. And and I'm holding and myself and holding sort of those, those tensions. Yeah. My children, with the, with the lockdown, I think my children also were kind of immersed in the conversation in a way that I hope was beneficial uh, to them. I hope that they were taking it in because all the conversations that I've, um, I've, I've done since taking over as uh, president of the ACLU and even before that, all through last summer, as someone who was involved in racial justice work and so responding to COVID and responding to um, pol- the policing, it was all done in my living room with them sitting, mm-hmm. you know, sitting beside me, hearing those discussions. And I, I really hope that it was um, the educational experience that I that I imagine in my head that it was for them to hear people um, to and not their mother because of course uh, you know kids discount whatever mom says. Uh, but listening mm-hmm. to the other people that I've been in conversation with um, to 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 saying incredibly eloquently speaking to pain, speaking to injustice, identifying for them what we're, that, what, what they're seeing and kind of explaining some of that. I think that that was that's a powerful moment um, as well that I hope really helps shape them and fortifies them as they mm-hmm. go out into into the world to, to fight these challenges long after you and I have, have, yep. have stopped. Yep. I'm only smiling because one of my kids said, mom, I, I finally know what you do. <laughs> and I remember just stopping dead in my tracks. Like, <laughs> like really <laughs> all those talks didn't matter, <laughs> but they've been able to see, see the work up, up front and personal. And I, and I do think that it will, will matter to them. Um, in the long run, mm. you know, re- regarding the videos, um, you know, one of the other um, speakers as part of this series was Jelani Cobb. And we spoke a little bit on just the the release of these videos. And, you know, of course, we're talking about the impact in our households. Do you think we understand the impact that it will have on us as a broader community mm-hmm. of witnessing these these videos over and over again. Yeah. So I, I do, do want to take a step back with the the videos. I have my husband and I have said whoever invented the the camera phone needs to win a Nobel Prize because it has transformed racial justice and social justice in this in this country. Um, kind of in the way that the videotaping the civil rights movement and broadcasting that on television helped to um, change conversations around civil rights and 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 advance civil rights. Without those videotapes, we would be at the same place with people discounting what Black people say and other people of color say goes on in their communities. Uh, we would be in a place where we are g- relying on this narrative, this stereotype that shapes so many of our conversations um, of excessive Black criminality. And that would shape how we viewed these stories. It would mean that uh, the defense of he resisted or she resisted would always win as it did before there were videotapes. And so I think we do have to pause um, and, and reflect on the way that the fact that these these incidents were taped and then broadcast is 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 just is allowing America to mm-hmm. see what we've seen and to know what we have known um, for so long. Uh, but really the, the collective trauma of, of watching those tapes over and over again 
Um, I think it's hard to, it's hard to measure. I feel weary. Mm-hmm. I feel tired in a way that I don't know I have felt before. Um, and in part it is, I think, having to relive those moments to watch them over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and so I do wonder what kind of impact it's going to have on us um, as a community. One positive thing is is just the way that I think it's built community, not only within, um, not only bet- with Black people, not only with uh, Latinx folks, but just the, the, a sense of community in the broader community and the mm-hmm. way that people have rallied um, behind those who have been targeted. We've seen it with the anti-Asian hate and those videos that have been captured and how powerful they have been in in helping people to rally around uh, Asian community as they're dealing with their pain um, to have a better understanding or awareness of the pain that they're going through and the, and, and the need for us to, to be in community and in solidarity with, with folks. I think that that has been um, powerful as well. Yeah. Do you think the, the law has kept up with the technology? Not at all. <laughs> Not in, um, you know, in, ter- in so many ways, and I think that's a lot of the work that the ACLU uh, is doing is to figure out how we address, um, regulate, embrace, protect um, these new technologies that are allowing people to connect and to communicate, um, to protest, to speak up, to be in dialogue, to document um, uh, in new and in, in powerful in powerful ways. Um, and, and so I think we're seeing challenges we didn't imagine, legal issues we didn't imagine, power and potential that we didn't imagine, and we needed to figure out uh, how the law responds to that in the criminal justice context, um, around Fourth Amendment and searches, technology creates a challenge for us in the First Amendment context, protecting the right to speak and and engage and um, not have government interference, and how far is the reach of the of, of the protections when we have private companies um, that host these conversations, but they they have become such important uh, components in the community and public dialogue. Uh, so how do we think about all of those things? How do we approach all of them? How does the law engage or not engage are, are issues that I think we will need to um, address as, as as we move forward. Uh, the mm-hmm. challenge to have the bandwidth, right, to, to um, fight, to think through these um, issues that we have fought for decades or centuries to address some of these more entrenched civil rights and social justice issues, but also to be able to think creatively and expansively about the new ones that are coming down the pike. Mm-hmm. Does the ACLU have a position on how quickly um, video cams uh, content should be released? In terms of uh, police body cameras? Yeah, the body cam. Uh, I think we think it's we think it's important that they be released. That okay. um, it's important for accountability. It's important for the public to know what happened and to know what happened as quickly as as possible. We we certainly understand the need to balance that with uh, privacy concerns or due process concerns. Um, but in light of those concerns, we still believe that the, this should happen as quickly as as possible. Uh, it's troubling that some mm-hmm. recent incidents that the family, the, the public are not getting access um, to what happened on those videotapes and that it doesn't serve, it doesn't serve anyone well. It, it undermines faith and trust. It undermines transparency. It undermines immediate accountability. Um, so there are, there, are, there are lots of concerns, but I think we do uh, fall in favor of releasing information to the public as quickly as possible. In uh, your presentation with the Westminster Town Hall Forum, you talked about how racism mutates. Mm -hmm. For those of us that are tuned in or those of us that are experiencing it, we more readily understand how, you know, when it mutates, what it feels like, how it's excluding, how it doesn't allow for that sense of belonging. But for, for others that may not understand, like if it keeps taking on new forms, 
how how does one stay in tune to what racism is or isn't? Yeah, I, I think for me, the one of the challenges of this conversation that we're having about um, systemic racism and the way that racism is woven into the fabric of America is to not lose that conversation, that thread that connects uh, chattel slavery, that connects Jim Crow, that connects legalized um, segregation, uh, that connects separate but equal to what we're seeing today. It is not that what we're seeing today is completely divorced and separate. Um, It was about this evolution and it was about an evolution that compounded the problems that came before. So I, I think it's important for us to have those conversations that help us connect the racism of the past with its current manifestation. Um, and, and in talking about the law, part of the, the challenge with using the law is that the law doesn't evolve as quickly in the way that racism evolves quickly. Um, we had a lot of conversations recently about a, a, a case Shelby versus Holder, where um, that case gutted the Voting Rights Act and eliminated one of the key provisions, Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, which was really, really fundamental to how we were able to transform our our democracy. And the way that Section 5 worked was that it tried to stay ahead of the discrimination. It tried to stay ahead of the way that in voting rights, we were evolving from outright denial to um, grandfather clauses, to literacy tests, to ID laws, to changing polling places. Um, And Section 5 required that any change in voting had to be preclared with the Department of Justice or with a court in D.C. And that meant that we were able to catch discriminatory laws before they were evolved and implemented. We were able to stop them. We didn't have to know what was coming next because whatever it was that was going to come next had to be cleared before it could be adopted. And we don't have that. Um, So we just have laws that evolve to get around the law. We have laws that really very precisely use a language to evade the law, to look a little bit different than what came before and different enough so that there's there's no legal precedent holding us holding us back. Um, An example is the way that we use the criminal legal system to achieve racial segregation and racial discrimination because our criminal legal system is, is, is a hallmark is racial inequality within that system at every stage of our, of our system on who gets stopped, who gets arrested, uh, who gets convicted, who is incarcerated and for how long are all plagued by racial inequality. And now we see using that racial inequality in the criminal legal system as the tool to advance racial segregation in, in housing. To say I'm not keeping people out because they're black, I'm keeping people out who have co- had, had contact with the criminal legal system. The result is the same. The tool is different, but the result is the same. And the law doesn't necessarily keep up and, and, and evolve as it needs to, to block this kind of, of, of evolution. And so uh, that's a challenge for us as a nation that relies so heavily on a court system to mm-hmm. advance and, and enforce equality. And I wonder, I think we are learning more clearly now the interdependence of our systems between housing and education and policing that I think traditionally we have um, sort of attacked them from a solution point of view um, as though they are isolated. Um, So we have uh, divorced it from its history in terms of solution setting. And we also are addressing it as though it is a siloed sort of event versus part of a broader ecosystem that allows for safety, security, and economic advancement. I think that's right there. And I think personally that segregation and housing is central to that because there's really nothing that place doesn't touch and control. Uh, Again, our access to food, our access to quality education, our access to economic opportunity, the 
the number and nature of our interactions with police uh, are all deeply impacted by where we live. But again, our um, education impacts and influences criminal legal system. The criminal legal system impacts and influences our economic policy, our transportation policy, both historically and today, impact access to economic opportunity, impact access to education. Everything is so woven together. Uh, And when I work with my students, I think part of the challenge is that my students and others believe that there is one lever that we can pull to solve inequality. If we can just identify that lever, um, right? And then they'll pull it and everything will be solved. And not spending the time to realize that even a moment on videotape where um, a police officer has taken the life of, of, of a Black person, so much has happened to bring them to that moment. It is not just a question of what happens um, between that individual police officer and that individual person. It is about what happens in our system of policing. It is what happens in our system of, of, of public safety. It is about segregation and inadequate housing and the way that segregation locks people out of opportunity, the way that we view a, a segregated Black community as more dangerous, and then how we respond by saying that it needs more policing. And it leads to over-policing, where someone cannot move without coming into contact with the police. They can't go about their, their everyday life without coming into contact with the police. And it's about how we then empower police to respond. It's about the way we uh, treat and address homelessness. It is about how we treat substance abuse uh, disorders. It's about how we're responding to high unemployment and lack of economic investment in communities of color. There's so much came into that into that moment. All those systems feed each other. Mm-hmm. All those systems. Um, yeah, I'm thinking about Richard Rothstein's book, The Color of Law. Always, everything. He, any, uh, everything, it's all yeah, in there. It's all about the color of law. <laughs> it really is. It's, it's all about the color of law. And when I think about, you know, segregated communities and um, there's lots of arguments out there about how to address the consequence of that. Mm-hmm. Um, but but overall, we're not suggesting that we need to integrate in order to have our rights be protected. Right. It's not about proximity to whiteness that should get us to justice. That's right. That's 100 percent right. Um, And I think we spend too much time thinking about how to make sure that uh, Black people and other people of color get access to white spaces and white communities, um, to white schools, to get access to the opportunities that have have really been hoarded in those communities. Um, And less time thinking about how we support, develop, build, um, and enable people of color to access opportunity and resources and what they need to live choice-filled lives um, right in their communities. It, it reminds me, um, historian Manning Marable and his theory of underdevelopment, and he uh, believes that our systems were built to intentionally and specifically underdevelop Black people and Black communities. And we have to do the work to identify those systems that were designed to underdevelop Black communities, to reinvest in those communities, to reverse um, the decades of disinvestment and discrimination that has made it so many, it has made so many of them inhospitable to success and opportunity for the people who live uh, within them. And so you're 100% right that it cannot um, be about. Um, access to and proximity to whiteness. Um, I think we have to do both, integrate those white spaces, challenge them as white spaces, um, make them accessible to everyone, but also do our best to better distribute resource and opportunity to all communities and stop the kind of resource hoarding that we, that we see now. Um, and then I would just add that as we integrate uh, communities of color, we have to do a better job of protecting um, the lives and opportunities of people who have lived and worked in those communities over decades, who are now facing um, displacement and exclusion from forces like gentrification. 
uh, things that we have to pay attention to so that the people who have lived there can continue to live there and prosper as we reinvest in those communities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've spent your career sort of working on issues of of equity and, and critical race theory. And I'm curious if this last year has taught you anything different about racism. Interesting question. Anything different about racism? I think that it has, this last year has um, proven to me so much of what I've been taught and learned and and what I understand about racism that we've seen it play out. Um, not only in with the racialized police violence, we saw it play out with COVID. We often hear people say when America catches cold, black people catch get pneumonia. And I so I saw that like with COVID that it impacted the world, um, but impacted people of color on another on another level. So I think so much of what I um, was taught and understand I saw mm. at play. What I what I do think I've learned what has been reinforced is the need for us to um, support young people who are engaged in the fight for social change, for us to take a step back and follow their lead. They are more creative, more passionate than, um, than I could have ever imagined. They don't feel constrained in any way by the conversations, um, by the fights, by the losses of the past. They're going to do what they have to do and then and force us all to come along with them. And I think I've learned that we should come voluntarily. <laughs> we should not be yeah. forced along. Right. We should do what we can to support them, to keep them out in the front, to keep them in the lead um, and then to uh, to follow their lead as they fight for uh, the communities in the America that that they deserve. Mm hmm. Yeah. And here you are, a daughter of uh, Jamaican immigrants, the first African-American black president of the ACLU. It's a bit of a bootstrap story. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Folks can say that once you've arrived at a certain level of success or security, that you are no longer interacting with racism in the same way. Um, has that been your experience? Uh, not at not at all. Um, I'm interacting with racism. I don't have the same challenges that I did before it, in the areas that w- in which racism and economic inequality uh, uh, come together. But certainly, I've interacted with have challenges around um, racism. Um, I'm just stuck on the, you know, it, it's funny. I, I do think people will say that that's a, um, her story is an example of you can, you know, fix, you fix this, you can change this, just pull yourself up. Um, but I, what I am is a story, an example um, of how our system can work if our system comes together. The, the kind of supports I got and my family got for um, economically. I am certainly the the beneficiary of affirmative action where people are looking at non-traditional qualifications and and seeing the the, the, the signs that someone has potential. I am the beneficiary of people who invested in me, who made sure, right? I what what we see today does not reveal all of the, the, the hundreds of people who have had to invest in me to make sure that I was um, successful. And so I just wanted to, to, to say that, that I'm here, not because I had some superhuman strength to pull myself up and to, 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 to change and overcome. I am here because so many people helped me navigate and cross and get over all the hurdles that were, that were in my way that I, that I, I, I was just lucky to have people in my life help me do that. Um, and I also, again, I said that I experience racism. I recognize my privilege that I don't have to um, as frequently experience it in the life and death ways that so many other people experience racism and economic inequality um, in their lives. During this pandemic, 
I had job security. I was able to keep my family fed. I was able to keep us safe. We had the privilege to be able to work remotely and to not have to go out. My children had the technology support and space to be able to take advantage of remote learning and education. And they had, we had the resources to supplement their education to make sure that they didn't lose ground. And I know, uh, and we had the, the medical care to make sure that we were healthy to be able to um, get the medical care and support that we needed to remain healthy. Um, so many people of color just didn't have those, those, those supports, that safety net, um, that structure, those, those resources and that privilege. And so I recognize that. But mm-hmm. I do come into work every day. I experience microaggressions. I was recently walking through the park. I'm uh, lucky to have my office near Washington Square Park in New York City. And I walked through the park and a man uh, came up to me and said, you're an N-word just like those at 125th Street. And then I had to come into to work and, and teach my class and go on about my day just as if nothing happened. Um, I have been the victim of discrimination more times than I can count. I have, I, I, I feel like racism has worked exactly the way it was designed to work in my life um, so often. Um, just as I was feeling a sense of belonging, a sense of achievement, there is racism to remind me that you don't fully belong. You are not fully accepted and you may never fully belong. And I'm going to remind you um, of that. So racism, it's a complicated thing. And so I will answer your question more succinctly by saying, yes, I still experience racism despite all that I have achieved. But yes, I recognize that my privilege um, makes it um, different um, Mm -hmm. and gives me resources to manage it, to navigate racism in a way that other people just don't have those those tools, resources, and support to manage the way that racism can really just put us in its vice and and squeeze us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was reading uh, one of your interviews or watching an interview where you um, talked about an incident that you had, I think, in high school. Yeah. And... I've had similar instances where a student, a white student, uh, called you the N-word. And I imagine much more happened than that. Yeah, I I feel like from the very beginning, um, even before that, I grew up in Connecticut. Uh, We were um, first in Hartford, Connecticut. And my parents were able to save and uh, maneuver to get us out of Hartford, which was incredibly and deeply segregated by race and class and move us to a working class suburb of Hartford uh, called Windsor, Connecticut. And when we moved, we were one of two black families in the neighborhood and our neighbors made it clear we weren't welcome. And um, at that point I was 10 or 11 and remember waking up to go outside on my way to school to find that KKK had been written on our house and our car. And my parents having to explain to um, just my brother and me at that time, uh, what KKK meant and why our neighbors didn't want us. And um, after that, I was just terrified to be in our house. I was terrified to go to school. I was terrified to go to the park, um, to walk those streets. And I ended up having to stay with my grandmother for a while. Um, and that continued. It continued in, in high school. Um, when I went to college, uh, really kind of still basking in the glow of being the first person in my family to graduate from, uh, to go on to college. Um, During my first semester, someone slipped a note under my door that said, go home, N-word. And then I was no longer feeling, I never felt safe at college. And I, it was my first semester and I had to go through an investigation and wonder every day, was it this woman who did that to me? Or was it this woman who, um, who is it that doesn't want me here? And what's going to happen next? And at the same time, still be a student and to do well and to take my final exam. Um, and so it's, you know, things like that just every day. I have a, a, a another memory that just came to me while we're talking of being so excited to have been named an Aspen's Idea Scholar. 
And I was going to, thank you, it was years ago, um, going to the Aspen Ideas Festival. And I'm on the plane to Aspen, the only black person on the plane. And the white woman next to me leans over and says, so are you going to Aspen to sing in one of the clubs? And I thought, (laughs) here it is again. And that through my time at, at the Aspen Ideas Festival, I just kept thinking about that. That really at every turn, um, I've been, I, I've, I'm reminded about why I do this work in ways big and small. Mm-hmm. I, I really appreciate you sharing all of that. And, the, and I think the reason that I raise it is because I think with the, with the videos and the conversations that issues of racism could be identified as those things that end with death. Mm-hmm. Or those things that get recorded Mm -hmm. and the day to day interactions that show up for people of color get missed. That's right. And that um, people may think that success erases those experiences. They live out, they play out differently, as you described, right? The, The interaction, the intersection between sort of the economic um, the class and race that, you know, they evolve. But I, I think it's important because that's right. You go into a place and, you know, are you here to meet someone? Like, why are you here? Like the questioning along the way and it stays with you while you're there. Like, they don't even think I belong here. <laughs> right. Like I was invited. I am the speaker. Right. <laughs> you know, like what what is happening right yeah. now? Um, and it's the anticipation and, that that's going to happen when I when I'm going into a space where I know People who look like me normally aren't. It's the anticipation of wh- where, how, where, how's it going to come at me? Where is it going to come? Who's going to do that? How, how has that informed your readiness? You know, unfortunately, I think it has, um, it has shaped. Uh, it has created a wall that I put up sometimes when I go into these new spaces and I meet new people. I don't necessarily anticipate that they're going to welcome me with open arms. I don't um, anticipate that, I, that everything will be fine. And instead you said, I'm ready. I'm ready for the different ways that I'm, I'm going to have to respond. I'm ready with my ID. I'm ready with when we had things that were in person with the letter saying, you know, con- thank you for agreeing to be our speaker. You should find Jim in room 5A. And I'm ready with the documentation to, to, to back up my right to be where I am. Um, and we, and I'm making my children do that as well, right? Making sure you have everything you need to prove that you are who you are, that you are where you're supposed to be, that you have a right to engage in that way. And we shouldn't have to live that way. I shouldn't have to, um, anticipate, um, the rejection and the discrimination and the hostility and prepare myself for it, embrace myself for it. Um, and really in asking the question, you, you're, you, you know, I'm thinking and just in every space that I go into, including in my classroom, I'm often prepared for the challenge that I think comes to a professor that looks like me versus a professor that doesn't look like me. I have to prepare in new and, 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 and different ways. Preparation for life takes on, on new meaning and new layers. Absolutely. Mm hmm. I taught a class here at one of the universities and um, one of the required readings was um, Robin DiAngelo, uh, White Fragility article. Mm -hmm. And one of the students uh, went to the dean because uh, they didn't think I should be requiring the reading to find out that the school required (laughs) (laughs) the, the reading. And I'm just like, it was just like, it was one of those moments where, and I remember thinking, man, why? like, I just don't want to do this. No. Um, Cause I know this is not going to end well. And, and how can I navigate this space? And, um, you know, I've been thinking a lot about the navigational skills that we learn as, as um, Brown and black people, as a black woman, you know, you have had to develop a skill set at a very early age of figuring how to move forward when people are trying to keep you back. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think it is, um, I think you said it so well, um, 
in, in the town hall presentation where you talked about, I think, or at least I put this down here, sort of black success and black pain, rage as a tool mm-hmm. um, to move forward. And I'm wondering if you, you know, before we go, if you'll just talk about how you've been able to use those experiences um, to inform, because they are, in fact, very painful. Um, but have you been able to to use them? And certainly for me, it inspires um, and motivates uh, me to continue in the in the hard work, because I don't want that for future generations yeah. and for for my kids and grandkids and so on. Yeah, I think you've said it um, better than I that than than I can. I have felt uh, that that pain of of racism in so many different ways. It motivates me to. Um, keep fighting for myself so that one day I can be in a space and feel without question, kind of comfort and relax and to, to, to breathe. I want my children to not have to navigate um, spaces like this, but I also think it informs who I am as, um, as a lawyer and, and as an advocate, because I know how this feels. I think people can too easily dismiss the pain that comes from this kind of racism, this um, death by a thousand cuts. And, mm-hmm. I, and, I, and I never do. I understand that um, the big victories are important, but it's also important for us to attend to and pay attention to the myriad everyday ways that we injure mind, body, and spirit, and the ways that we make it so that people can't live choice-filled lives. Those things happen every day, moment to moment, um, you know, day to day, week to week. And we need to attend to those things um, as well. And so I try to use all of my experiences, the ones of the past, the ones that um, happened yesterday, the ones that I know are to come to continue to be motivated uh, to, to do this work. This work can be hard. As I said, it, there's ebbs and it flows. Um, progress is always meant, met with resistance and retrenchment. We take two steps forward, one step back. Sometimes we take two steps forward and we take two steps back. Um, but I'm, I'm motivated by that mm-hmm. pain to not want to continue to experience it myself and to not want my children to experience it. As I said, for them to not um, worry about their children the way that I worry about them, but for them not to worry about navigating life the way that I have had to worry about navigating life. That's a very hopeful message. And, and as we um, wrap, part of what feels like a, a balm for me, right, is to be able to, to know that the work that I'm doing every day is, is, yeah. is mattering to people that are experiencing mm-hmm. the same level of pain. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you're feeling that through your work, like not just at the ACLU, but beyond. Yeah. So I feel it in my everyday work, in my work at NYU where I teach the civil rights clinic and I am the co-director of our center on race and equality and the law. Um, I feel um, a sense of healing and purpose um, in, in doing this work. And I think the same is with the, is true with the ACLU. And as I said before, there's so much at stake in our society right now, not just on racial justice um, issues, but on other issues where there has been damage to communities where we have to rebuild those communities, but also important work for how to move forward. And I think um, the, the work of the ACLU spans the waterfront and it's going to continue to really cover the waterfront of civil rights and civil liberty, liberty issues. Uh, I think our priorities have to include increasing access to the ballot box. We have to mm-hmm. fight the escalating attacks on transgender people, particularly transgender kids around the country. Uh, You've raised some of the challenges around free speech and privacy, including defend freedom of expression online. We've got to advance Fourth Amendment protections against high tech government surveillance, um, challenge discriminatory uses of artificial intelligence, and really also um, expanding and protecting the rights of immigrants, uh, LGBTQ rights and reproductive rights. Right. So there's so much work to be done that it's some days you, you're, you're too focused, <laughs> too tired, too busy um, to, to, to think of anything else but how we move forward. And certainly that is a wonderful place to be in, to have the tools and the opportunities uh, to transform 
our community and our, and our nation. And certainly um, the work of the ACLU gives me hope, provides me with motivation, but also really importantly, an opportunity to make the difference um, and to see the kind of change that I want to see in my community. Mm -hmm. Deborah Archer, it's been nice talking with you. It was such a pleasure to meet you. Thank you for having me. It was really a lovely conversation. I hope we can talk again. Thanks again for our friends at Target for sponsoring this episode. If you're interested in sponsorship, please email or give us a call. Visit MinneapolisFoundation.org for our contact information. Thanks to Deborah Archer for being on the show and Shonda Smith-Baker for being our host Sarah Gillen for making the artwork and copy for this episode, and Darlin Benjamin for coordinating and making this conversation happen. If you like this episode, you can tweet Shonda at Shonda S. Baker and let her know. And if you really want to say thank you, please follow us and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcast. This is Sue Pak Keenitz from the Minneapolis Foundation. Thanks for listening, and I'll talk to you next week.